Hello everyone. I'm uh, Irini Sofia Kiapidou and I'm Assistant Professor of Byzantine Philology at the University of Patras. My research concerns the literature of early and middle Byzantine period with emphasis on historiography, epistolography, paleography and critical edition of Byzantine texts. Methods and process of history writing in Byzantium, the use of sources, the writer's presence in his work, Textual relations between works and gender issues are some of the things I'm dealing with in my papers. In the following 25 minutes, I'll introduce you to the field of Byzantine historiography and the historical texts, focusing in parallel on the status and personality of the writers, their aims and principles of composing their works. The key questions for us will be, what is Byzantine historiography? Who wrote history in Byzantium? Why and how? The writing of historical narratives has a strong claim to be the most significant contribution to secular literature made in the Byzantine world. Its prominent role among other literary genres in Byzantium lies basically in the quantity and quality of Byzantine history writing. Over more than a millennium and almost without interruption, events were recorded, ordered and discussed by a sequence of writers in texts that can be conventionally classified into two broad categories, histories and chronicles, as the founding father of Byzantine studies, Karl Kumbacher, proposed in 1882 in his Geschichte der Byzantinischen Literatur. Two basic differences can be traced between them. First, historians present a certain and consciously chosen part of Byzantine history, usually that of their lifetimes and in the recent past, in a well-structured and analytical text. Chronographers, on the other hand, chronologically list various events of the world history from Adam to the present time of each one of them. Two, historians imitate the classical Greek historical writers, such as Herodotus and Thucydides, mainly in language and style. They adopt their vocabulary and characteristic narrative techniques, for example, fictional rhetorical speeches, with varying success, of course, according to each one's knowledge and talent. Why do Byzantine historians do such a thing? because they consider themselves to be the successors of the classical historians, the next link in the chain of this general's evolution. Chronographers on the other side use a simple, unpretentious language, very close to the so-called common language of the New Testament. I'll mention one striking example. Classicizing historians, namely historians who imitate the classical patterns, instead of using the names of their contemporary tribes that Byzantium had to face in its immense borders, they often use the approved ancient names such as Scythes, Midi, etc., referring either to the Huns or the Bulgarians or the Serbians. In other words, they were willing to sacrifice historical accuracy in favor of classicism. However, the form of Attic Greek and Byzantine that, that Byzantine historians used was inevitably accessible only to a limited educated audience, whereas the audience for the easily conceivable world chronicles was potentially much wider. This is the reason why some of the classicizing histories circulated in Byzantium in parallel vernacular versions. Fortunately, they have come down to us. It goes without saying that Krumbacher's division in historians and chronographers serves not only practical research needs, but also reflects existing textual differences. The latter are to some extent confirmed by relevant references of the Byzantine writers themselves. The truth is, however, that the narrow implementation of Krumbacher's criteria does not function for every work in every Byzantine period. Thus, 
there is inevitably a debate on particular works. What is, for example, Synopsis Historion of John Scalise's in the 11th century? A history or a chronicle? What are the criteria? It is written in a rather simple language, presenting a remarkable variety of events in a strict chronological order, but the narration is limited to the description of a certain period from 811 till 1057, even though it has the word history in its title, Synopsis Historion. That is why modern scholars classify this work either as a chronicle or as a history. While the distinguishing line between histories and chronicles can be quite easily drawn in the early Byzantine period, it is fading away afterwards when Byzantine historical works actually present figures of both histories and chronicles. Apart from what we consider to be called history or chronography, it is equally important to examine what Byzantines themselves understood and labeled as history and chronography. Let me just say that Byzantines appear to use the terms history and chronography in a rather loose way, a fact that should be taken into account in the study of Byzantine historiography. The final triumph of Christianity and its imperial establishment by the first Byzantine emperor, Constantine I, generated a new focus for historiography. A new subgenre, the ecclesiastical history, was created then by Constantine's close advisor, Efsevios, Bishop of Caesarea in Asia Minor. In the 4th century, Efsevius recorded the church's progress from the apostles through the Diocletian's persecution until the reign of Constantine I. His work was continued in the 4th and 5th century by other authors, such as Gelasios, Socrates Scholasticos, Sozomenos, Evagrios, who also wrote ecclesiastical histories because there was a demand for the ecclesiastical disputes and theological controversies of their lifetimes to be recorded. After the 6th century and the final resolution of the main theological issues by the six ecumenical councils, there was no need for composing a specific history of the church. So the subgenre of ecclesiastical history vanished and relevant events such as the consecration of a patriarch or a bishop are included in other historical works as well. In any case, a big number of Byzantine historical narratives, more than 50, came down to us through a rich manuscript tradition, and that can only indicate the large circulation of these texts in Byzantium. Moreover, scholars of the so-called Macedonian Renaissance in the Middle Byzantine period, such as the Patriarch Photios and the learned Emperor Constantine the Porphyrogenitos the seventh. Porphyrogenitos, it means the one who was born in Porphyra, the room of Empress's birth giving. So they have incorporated in their encyclopedic compilations fragments of lost historical works, or at least the names of their writers and titles who would otherwise have been totally unknown to us. But who were those actually interested uh, in writing history in Byzantium? There are three main categories of writers. First, high-ranking officers, mostly close to an emperor. Second, people of the church, both high ecclesiastical servants and simple monks. They were mostly concerned with displaying the history of the church and supporting at the same time the orthodox positions in the framework of the great Byzantine ecclesiastical controversies. These were the heresies in the first Christian centuries and the long lasting controversy over the Christian icons worship, the well known iconoclasm of the 8th and 9th centuries. And C, scholars, sometimes relatives of an emperor, the case of 
Anna Comnina, the daughter of the Emperor Alexios Komnenos I and her husband Nikiforos Brienios are very striking examples. They both wrote histories in the 12th century. Even the emperor himself, this is the case of uh, Ioannis Kantakuzinos the, the sixth, um, the emperor who wrote his memoirs in one of the most important historical sources for the 14th century. Education was the prime qualification of these authors, certainly a higher one regarding historians, because they also had to understand the tradition in which they worked and so present their narrative appropriately. Why history was written in Byzantium? Sometimes scholars would decide to compose a history or a chronicle besides their other various literary works. Why would they do this? In their poems, writers often describe the circumstances under which they composed their texts, giving a variety of excuses. They might refer to a certain person, a friend, who urged them to history writing or admit that, that they were inspired by the great events they had experienced and um, it only seemed worthy to write them down as accurately and impartial as possible. They mostly declare the seeking of the truth as their ultimate aim and their hope to offer with their work a useful historical handbook to future generations better and more accurate than the already existing ones. In the Byzantine historical poems, one can also find the author's criticism for his predecessors, as well as a description of his personal writing principles and methods. They insist on careful selection of former written sources, use of the credible ones only, omission of sources, comments, etc. Many of these introductory remarks are more or less standard commonplaces of expressions that can be traced in historical texts all over the Byzantine period. Whether uh, each author managed to keep the promises he gives or not, it deserves to be studied separately. So, it has been shown that only few writers actually talk seriously when they insist on their pure interest for the historical truth, regardless of their final achievements. John Scilegis is one of them. Living in the 11th century, he is very critical when he uses written sources of the 10th century, avoiding in most cases their laudatory comments for individuals, emperors and members of powerful noble families and certain actions as well. Others, however, aim mostly at impressing the emperor or a powerful public servant close to them in order to gain favor. See, for example, the imperial judge, Mikhail Ataliatis, his history that covers the years from 1043 to 1079, excludes the virtues and claims of the contemporaneous emperor, Romanos Diogenes IV. At the same time, it is dedicated to the emperor, Nikiforos Vutaniatis III. Needless to say that both emperors were his patrons. In the 12th century, John Kinamos, one of the secretaries of the Manuel, uh, of Manuel uh, Komnenos I, uh, writes a history which intends to glorify his emperor. See also Mikhail Kritovulos, the one of the four last Byzantine historians, the so-called historians of the fall, meaning the fall of Constantinople in 1453 to the Ottomans. Having been quickly adjusted to the Ottoman reality, Kritovulos did not in fact write a history of the fall of Constantinople, but a biography of Mehmed the Conqueror. He believed that the fall of the Byzantine capital was all for the best and Greeks would benefit from the Turkish rule. 
There are also writers who have put their works at the direct service of the emperor and the imperial propaganda. See, for example, Constantine Porphyrogenitus, who commissioned firstly a historian named Iosif Genesio, Joseph Genesios, and then an anonymous one conventionally known today as Theophanes Continuatus to cover the period from 811 down to the emperor's own times in the 10th century. Adopting a biographical approach centering on the deed of each emperor, these two authors intended their works to glorify and legitimize the Macedonian dynasty and its founder, Basil I, Constantine's grandfather, who became an emperor by murdering the legal emperor, Michael III. Constantine was fully aware of the power of history, and he tried not only to justify his father's act, his grandfather's action, but also, through his authors, declared his alleged glorious origin from the Persian noble family of Arsacides on one hand and Constantine I on the other. What's highly interesting is that Genesius, as well as Theophanes Continuatus, declare their connection with the emperor at the very beginning of their works. Genesius begins with a dedicative epigram to Porphyrogenitus, to whom he offers his text as a gift after having carried out his command to compose such a work. And a few lines later, he repeats that he was ordered by, by this great emperor to write his historical work. The same, although not so clearly said, applies to the case of Anna Comnena. Her history, name, Alex, named Alexias, reflects the official Comnenian view of the restoration of the empire and consists in many ways an apology of her father, Alexios Komnenos the first, whose wife, whose life and achievements are here idealized. Let me remark at this point that Anna is the only woman um, who wrote a historical work, not only in Byzantium, but in the whole medieval world, and one of the few Byzantine women who actually wrote something, or to be more precise, whose work has come down to us. You see, there was a lack of women's education in Byzantium, even among the noble and privileged ones. But there was also a lack of interest to copy and thus preserve a woman's work to the next generations. Be careful though, the fact that the above mentioned writers and so many more aimed at personal benefits through their historical compositions, as well as at the recording of the history, doesn't necessarily reduce the significance of their works. On the contrary, the high imperial offices and the close relation to the court meant also easy access to various sources and therefore broader information and notice that leads us to the final question of my lecture, namely how a Byzantine historical work was composed. First of all, there was a strong sense of continuity. I mean that the authors were very conscious of the continuity of Byzantine history, which was basic to the Byzantine sense of identity and try to justify the writing of history, either as a continuation of a particular historian or as a world history, meaning a world chronicle beginning from the creation of the world. Byzantine historical works were written in prose. However, two extensive verse world chronicles are preserved namely Constantinos Manassi's Synopsis Chronicae from the 12th century and the Frem's Chronicle from the 14th century, which recast Byzantine history in a romantic and poetic vine. Especially the first work is considered one of the masterpieces of Byzantine literature, fully adjusted to the literary demands and taste of the 12th century, the so-called Comnenian Renaissance. 
Many authors based their work on autopsy as they displayed events that they had either eyewitnessed themselves or learned from the narrations of actual witnesses. Consequently, the autobiographical element is strongly present in their text. I'll, I'll mention the most characteristic example, the case of the famous and multifarious scholar of the Middle Ages, Mikhail Pselos. His Chronographia, chronographia, interesting choice of title, as his work has little to do with the chronicle. So his work deals with the period when Pselos was close uh, to the center of power from 1043 to uh, 1059. So in a biographical approach, his narrative consists of a series of portraits of the emperors that Mikhail Pselos had known intimately. But the radical element of his historical work is his decision to put himself at the center of his work. Pselos is a participant in his narration, and there are long passages of autobiography which are designed to justify his heading role in the education and political life of his times, as well as uh, to uh, describe his emotional state in its case. Most of the writers, though, combined personal experience and written sources according to the period they presented. See, for example, Ioannis Zonaras, John Zonaras, a chronographer of the 12th century. After having served Alexios Komnenos, he went into monastic retirement after Alexios' death. And among other things, he devoted himself to compiling a world chronicle. Only the section for Alexios Komnenos, namely his own lifetime, is original based on Zonaras' personal experiences, whereas the rest of his text is a compilation of former written sources. A Byzantine historical writer doesn't feel obliged to cite the texts he's using. He may use a general phrase, Os fasi, as they say, or os legete, as it is said, and nothing more. So, it's a modern scholar's job to trace the text sources and to check the textual dependence of one work to another. A writer usually used his sources in a critical way. He either omitted or added pieces of information, he transformed the structure and content, he adjusted their language and style, aiming at composing a new, his very own, and hopefully better work. There were parts, however, in his final texts that have been adopted directly from the sources, more or less copied, as there was no sense of authorship or plagiarism in Byzantium. And I could mention here, an extreme example of the late 11th, early 12th century, the case of George Cadenos. In his World Chronicle, he directly copied, word by word, Skilic's work for the presentation of the years 811-1057. So, we should be extra careful in the area of Byzantine historiography. We might, we might read, for instance, in a passage that a monastery is survived eos nin, till now, and logically assume that it refers to the author's lifetimes. However, there is a possibility that this exact phrase, till now, was copied by mistake by the writer from a former written source. Then, as you can imagine, the preserved information is completely different. This particular monastery, and I've borrowed this example from my own research on Skiliges, it wasn't necessarily there in the writer's lifetime, but his sources were composed, but, uh, but uh, when his sources were um, composed, and that might have been centuries ago. By way of conclusion, allow me one final remark. Historical works 
as well as other literary works in Byzantium were primarily meant not to be read, but to be performed by scholars in front of other scholars in order to be known and literally be criticized as well. These meetings were regular. They were organized by the scholars themselves or their rich patrons and called theatron, theatra in plural. In Byzantium, there was no theater in terms of either writing a theatrical play or performing an already existing one. Therefore, the scholars theatra were the only ones existing and writers really tried hard to impress their audience with their knowledge of the classical past, the vivid descriptions of the events, even the tone or the order of their words in a clearly rhetoric approach of the written language. So in the framework of Byzantine philology, historical works, apart from being important for their pure historical information, they are nowadays studied more and more under the perspective of literature and rhetoric. The results of this study can sometimes be really remarkable as they underline hidden aspects of these works. Nevertheless, we should be once again very careful because the actual focus of every Byzantine historical composition was primarily the recording of historical events, not lit literature or rhetoric. rhetoric themselves. Thank you very much for your attention.